Okay, let's mathematically define what we mean by a multiple variable linear model and see how it applies to our glucose problem. Okay, if you recall from the last section, our glucose problem is this. We have 10 attributes of each sample, such as the age, sex, and some blood measurements. And we want to try to predict from these attributes the target variable. That is, we want to find a function that produces a prediction, y hat, as a function of, these, of this vector of 10 measurements. Now, there are a large number of such functions, particularly once you start thinking about multivariable functions. A linear regression model is a particular case where we just assume a simple linear function. In our glue case case, it's just like this. Our target value is our glucose, and we're going to make a prediction, which is some offset plus a linear um, weighting of each of the 10 attributes. We'll call those variables by beta. So it'll be beta 1 times the age, times beta 4 times the blood pressure, beta 5 times the first blood measurement, and so on. Or, more generally, if y is our target, y hat is our prediction, we have an intercept and then the linear combination of the features x1 to x10. All right, with this is my idea, let's talk about this model in a little bit more general. In general, we have k features, which we represent as a vector, x1 to x10, and these are the predictors or all the other possible names. And we have some target variable, which for now we'll just assume is a scalar real valued number. This is what we want to predict. A linear model just makes the prediction that y hat is a linear combination of those features. So there's the intercept term plus the k coefficients. When we want to fit this model, by what we do is that we have training data that is samples of xi with labels that we know y hat, and we have n of them. So each label, each sample has a vector of values that we could write xi1 to xik, and a scalar target yi. And somehow from this data xi and yi, we want to find the coefficients in this model. Here's just another simple case, just as an, another example. Suppose that uh, you're this scientist here, trying to study this athlete, and maybe what you're trying interested in doing is measuring their heart rate as a function of attributes of the exercise. In this case, you could say I'm going to look at the heart rate increase as a linear function, as an offset, maybe as a function of the minutes that they exercised plus the exercise intensity. And we would do this, we would get data like this. We'll return to this problem, this data in your take home or in class exercise. Now, you might ask why would you want to use a linear model at all? Well, the reality is that most, many natural phenomena have a linear relationship. Most commonly, it occurs from this. Suppose that the target variable y is some possibly even nonlinear function around x. But if the variation of x is small around some nominal value, then you can just apply calculus to take a linear approximation of that function. And once you had to take a linear approximation, if that's valid, you'll see that y is a linear function of that, those variables. The another benefit from this is that the model is very simple to compute. After you've learned the beta values I, and I give you an x, it's very simple to come up with a prediction for y, just linear multiplication. A third benefit is that it's easy to interpolate, interpret. Each coefficient beta j tells you the importance of the, that feature for the target. Specifically, it tells you how much you would expect that uh, target to change with a corresponding change in x. So, for example, it would tell you in the glucose case how much you would expect the glucose to change as a function of the age. If you've taken the probability class, you know, there's another more advanced reason. If you don't know this, it's absolutely no problem. But if you recall that if x and y are Gaussian random variables, or what more specifically, jointly Gaussian, then you know that the optimal predictor of one from the other is a linear predictor. 
Okay, now um, in the undergraduate class, I might sometimes review a little bit of matrix algebra, but I just put this up here, this slide, just to make sure that you will be able to do, you should know before continuing in this class how to do basic linear algebra operations. If you don't know these, don't worry, you can find out a lot of references on the web. So if I give you matrices like A and B and vectors X, you should know how to do things like matrix multiple vector multiplication, transposes, matrix matrix multiplications, solving for equations, and taking inverses. Some of these are not particularly easy to do by hand, but at least in principle you should know how to do them. Before we continue on, it's useful to introduce a little bit more terminology that you will sometimes see. What we've written up to now is the model in terms of a coefficient vector beta. That's y hat is some beta 0 plus the beta j's times the xj's. But you'll often see it written as the, with weight and what's called the weight and bias. In this case, it's written like a, a intercept b plus wj's times the xj's. The two models are exactly identical. It's just different letters to represent the same idea. Specifically, b corresponds to the term beta 0, or which is the bias, and w, that vector, corresponds to the k coefficients of beta, and in this model they're called the weights. Both are completely fine, they're just different notation. Now, Either way you write it, with either the coefficients or the weights and biases, you can write them as an inner product. For example, if you use the coefficient representation, you can say that y hat is b beta 0 plus an inner product between the k coefficients of beta and x. Or, in the weight bias version, as b plus the weight vector inner product with x. Recall that the inner product between two vectors, and the two vectors have to be the same size, is just the sum of the products of their coefficients. So when you take that formula here, you exactly get this. You can also see the inner product written with alternative notation as w transpose times x, or sometimes you'll see it with this bracketed notation. So all of these are just different notations to describe the same idea. It's also useful, before we continue, to try to write the linear regression, or at least the training part, in matrix form. To make that clear, suppose we have data samples xi, yi, and recall that each sample xi is a vector of k coefficients. If I gave you a coefficient vector, beta, then the prediction for y hat for that sample, which is y hat i, would be beta 0, plus the beta j's times the corresponding um, attributes or features in the ith sample. Now, we can write this in matrix form like this, where there's a vector of the n predictions, this matrix, which is just basically a column of ones and the data matrix x, and a vector of the p, which is k plus 1 coefficients. Just to see why this formula works, just recall how matrix, matrix vector multiplication works. If you want to get the first coefficient y hat 1, you multiply the first row of the matrix times that column. So 1 times beta 0 plus x11 times beta 1 up to x1k times beta k. And then you'll get exactly get this expression here when i is equal to 1. Similarly, you then go to the next coefficient by going down one row, and when you do the same multiplication, you get the value for i equals 2, until you go through all the values up to i is equal to n. You can also write that as a matrix occasion, where this vector y hat is just the matrix, is just the multiplication between the feature matrix A and the coefficient beta. Alright, before you continue on, you can now try just doing the short little in-class exercise. In this case, we went back to that heart rate example, and all you have to do is just find from this data the right the feature matrix and y, and also make a simple prediction.